Today, we are joined by MK, a new contributor to this channel. We're going to be taking a look at Jihad. We're gonna start with some information that's probably fairly familiar to you, but then we're going to dive deeper. We're gonna, as Yasser Kadi would say, take a deep, deep dive. And when we do that, things are gonna be a little awkward for the Muslims. So thank you for joining me today, MK. Before we get into the subject at hand, why don't you introduce yourself to the audience? Tell us a little bit about who you are and your background and why this is a subject you want to cover. Thank you very much for having me on. So yeah, I used to be pretty liberal, right? And I believe that Islam was peaceful and people just twisted the true meaning of jihad. These typical things. But then as I listened to the normal people on YouTube, I started to realize I wasn't told the truth and I no longer believed the typical narrative in the mainstream. But it was always something missing in a sense for me. Like people leave just enough room for Muslims to reinterpret and twist things. It's not always very convincing reinterpretations, of course, but they were still given that luxury to reinterpret. But then after a while, I, I've actually found Lloyd de Jong on YouTube. So he introduced me to the Sharia. And then he led me to find more primary sources and Muslims and Muslim books, actually, and sources only available in Arabic. So I went down a rabbit hole and then down another rabbit hole. And then I had those translated and looking back, like from what I knew a couple of years ago to compare to now, it's completely two worlds apart. So I perceived this gap in the comprehensiveness regarding a lot of the controversial topics, right? And this motivated me to research the topics I have in depth because I want to cover every aspect so people can no longer in good conscience reinterpret and twist things in order to suit their desires. So my goal, right? It's only to present my research and inform people as best I can. So I'm not trying to be like condescending or rude or disrespectful, right? I don't want to trigger emotional reactions or anything like that. I just want to present what the Muslim scholars themselves have said on this topic. So I keep my personal thoughts to a minimum because me, I'm not relevant. Islam and what the Muslims themselves say, that is relevant. So in the beginning, right, we start with the basics. What is Jihad? The linguistic meaning of jihad means striving or laboring heavily. And this is normally what a lot of westernized Muslims focus on. So you will see this a lot in the apologetic scene online where people aren't necessarily lying, right? But they are only presenting half truths. There is an important distinction between jihad of the self and jihad with the self. So jihad of the self is regarding fighting your passions, learning and acting upon guidance, things like this. While jihad with the self is like fighting the disbelievers. So this is not an exhaustive list full of examples, but I just want you to be aware of these distinctions. We yeah. often hear from the, the Western Muslims that, you know, jihad just means struggle. And as you point out, that this is not necessarily a lie, but it's not the whole truth either. So we need to take a, a closer look and, and kind of see both sides of the coin. We want to be fair here. We want to fairly represent what Muslims believe. But at the same time, we don't want to just give them a blanket slate where they can just say whatever they want, and then we don't look into it. We need to look into their claims and see how they stack up to those of the Islamic scholars. Exactly, exactly. Ibn Ajah al-Asqalani, he put it best when he said in Fat al-Bari, with respect to the decrees of Islam, this means expending effort in fighting the disbelievers. So when you look at the Quran, Sunnah, and the Hadiths, Jihad primarily means fighting the disbelievers in order to make Allah's word supreme. So, for example, right, in Quran 941, 973, and 66 verse 9, it commands Muslims to wage jihad against the disbelievers. And you can open any of the tafsirs, right, like Ibn Kafir, Al-Mahalli, they will all tell you it is with the sword. And same with Al-Tabri, it says with the sword and with weapons. And the same with Al-Zamakhshari, with the sword. Al-Qurtabi, with the sword. 
So they're all repetitive, it's with the sword. So we can't focus on the one meaning and then completely ignore the primary meaning in the sources is half-truths is misleading. In terms of the hadith, there are numerous hadiths that talk about jihad as being waged against the disbelievers, right? So it's warfare. So in Sahih Bukhari, Sunan Abu Dawood, all of these collections repeatedly affirm this. Coming back to the question, what is jihad? So it is important for me that what I am saying, I want to show it in the primary sources. So it's in the Quran and the Hadith. But when a Muslim hears a non-Muslim like me speaking on the subject, it's easy for them to make an excuse. Oh, what does he know? He just hates Islam. He doesn't know anything about my religion, right? That, that's the attitude. So because of this, I don't give my own opinion unless I can substantiate it with Muslim scholars backing me up. I will not propose anything as a fact throughout this entire video unless I can show it from the Muslim scholars themselves. Excellent. That's a very good way to avoid inserting our personal opinions and elevating our personal opinions to the, the level of doctrine is by going and looking at what the scholars say. If what we're saying agrees with what the scholars are saying, then we're probably on the right track. If we're saying something different, then we're probably not on the right track because the truth should be fairly obvious. It shouldn't be something that was hidden for hundreds or thousands of years and then suddenly discovered in modern times. It should have been obvious to the earliest Muslims. So if what they're saying is one thing and what the modern Muslim is saying is something different, then we have to say, well, which one's more likely to know? The people who are close to the time that the, these things were originally written or the, the modern Muslim in the comment section who isn't even necessarily very aware of what their own scholars today have to say. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So I want to make this even more explicit, right? So we're going to look at a little bit more scholars. Ibn Abidin, he said that it is calling to the religion of truth and fighting whoever does not accept the school in reality. Al Castellani said, the fighting of the disbelievers to give support to Islam and to raise high the word of Allah. Sulaiman al Bujairimi said it means to fight in the way of Allah. So they are explicit that, yeah, it's fighting. Then Al Atab, he said, in the Sharia, Ibn Arafah said a Muslim fighting an unbeliever without a covenant to exalt the word of Allah. Ibn Harun said it is fighting the enemy to raise the word of Islam. And then, lastly, Al Sanani he said in, in the Sharia, expending all efforts and energy in fighting the disbelievers or the transgressors. So it is quite repetitive, right? And that's exactly my point. So the most respected and well-learned scholars throughout history repeatedly affirm that jihad is waging war against the non-Muslims. When Westernized Muslims only want us to focus on a very specific meaning of jihad and ignore the Quran, the Sunnah, and 14 centuries of Muslim scholars agreeing with what we are saying, it's very misleading to say the least. And then I have a section in my research called Muslim Martyr Mentality. I just want to shine a light on the glorious nature of jihad from the Islamic perspective. Muhammad said, I wish that I could be killed in the cause of Allah, then brought back to life, then be killed, then be brought back to life, then be killed, then be brought back to life, and then be killed. And that the house of martyrs in paradise is the most superior. Paradise is under the shades of swords. Waging jihad against the disbelievers is the greatest deed one can do. And that dying during jihad will make Allah forgive all of your sins. So when you put all of these things together, right, we have a prophet who wants to be martyred over and over again, claiming that jihad is the greatest deed imaginable, that martyrdom cleanses us from our sins and that paradise is under the shades of swords. So should we then be surprised that people like Ibn Qayyim say that jihad is the apex of Islam and specify that it is indeed with the sword and the spear? Some Muslims will try to rationalize this and say that, well, dying for your faith, it is a beautiful thing and that the Hadiths is perfectly okay. But just keep in mind this glorification of jihad and martyrdom in mind as we proceed and see that jihad is not merely defensive and that dying in the cause of Allah is not some heroic and virtuous act to be celebrated. On the contrary, it's evil because this is also dealing with offensive jihad. So keep this glorification of jihad and martyrdom in mind as we proceed.
if we look at the Quran, I would say it's probably even worse than the Hadiths. So in Quran chapter 8 verse 67, it is not for a prophet that he should have prisoners of war until he had made a great slaughter in the land. You desire the good of this world, but Allah desires the year after. The verse is saying that you shouldn't take captives in order to ransom people to get more earthly goods before you have killed many of them. And in Tafsir al Jalalain it says that is utmost to kill the disbelievers. The reward there is for killing them. That's the year after. So heaven is the reward for killing disbelievers. In al tabari he wrote that until he has given his utmost to kill the idolaters in it and has won a victory over them by domination and subjugation. Sahid ibn Jubair said, until you have massacred them by killing. al Nisaburi he said, wreaking havoc is plentiful killing and spreading it heavily in harshness and intensity. The intent is to degrade disbelief and weaken it and to strengthen Islam and make it manifest by spreading killing among the disbelievers. Before you go on there, I just want to comment briefly on that verse. Notice how it's not just about spreading Islam, it's not just about defending Islam, it's about killing, right? That just taking the unbelievers as captives isn't good enough. You have to kill a bunch of them and you have to subjugate them and you have to make them feel humiliated just converting people to Islam is not good enough. You have to go on the offensive and kill the unbelievers to make others convert. Yeah, exactly, because it does eradicate shirk and kufr. That's one of the foundational reasons for jihad is to eradicate disbelief. So that's why killing is so important for them. So moving on to Quran chapter 48 verse 29, it says, Muhammad is the messenger of Allah and those who are with him are severe against the disbelievers but merciful with each other. al Dawi said that the meaning is that they are harsh on whoever opposes their religion, but merciful to each other regarding what is between them. Ibn Adil wrote, harsh to them like a lion on its prey, with no compassion taking hold of them regarding them, but merciful with each other, sympathetic to each other, friendly towards each other, like a father with a child. I might have laughed at the contrast seen above. You are sympathetic and friendly towards your fellow Muslims, right? Like a father with a child. And then you go from Barney the dinosaur to John Wick or Rambo, and you are harsh like a lion on his prey with no compassion taking hold of them. It seems that there's two groups of people that are very different. And there's the Muslims that you treat well. You're kind to them, you're merciful. If they do something wrong, you, you're forgiving. Then there's the unbelievers who you have to be harsh with. You have to treat them like your prey, seize them, capture them, kill them, because they're a different class of people who you can't be compassionate. You can't be trusting of them. You can't be friendly with them because they're evil in the eyes of Islam. Yeah, this doesn't sound like the gospel Jesus preached, by the way, but yeah, moving on. We're going to look at the concept of abrogation because this is very important. So you can find the concept of abrogation in Quran chapter 2 verses 106. For example, the permissibility of intoxicants in Islam. It was originally allowed, but it ended up being prohibited altogether at a later point. Muslim scholars usually divide the progression concerning jihad into four stages. So I use this division since I found it to be the most used and the most helpful. But please just keep in mind that some Muslims have divided it into three stages or even more than four. Nevertheless, they agree on the core message of offensive jihad. But please just keep in mind that the four stage division of jihad isn't canonical or something. Sometimes they are five, sometimes three, sometimes something else. And they might even describe the intermediate stages a little bit differently from one another. But the last stage, that's the consensus. And that's the most important one. People often wonder how many verses have actually been abrogated. There's no clear answer to this because there are different views, but we can look at a couple of the scholars and what they have said. So, for example, Asim Khandi, he said the following. It is said that this verse, kill the idolaters wherever you find them, 
abrogated 70 verses in the Quran about truces, covenants, and restraint. Sadiq Hassan Khan, he said, this verse ordering to kill the polytheist is general for every polytheist. This verse abrogated every verse which mentions turning away from the polytheist and being patient with them. Ibn Atiyah said that this verse abrogated all peacemaking and truce-making in the Quran, and this amounts to 114 verses. So you will also see other scholars like al Bayhaqi, Ibn al-Jawzi, and many others say, repeatedly emphasize that the, how many peaceful verses have been abrogated. So you pointed out that they disagree on the exact number of verses abrogated. But my question to you would be, is there any scholar of Islam that says that the peaceful verses abrogated the more violent ones? Because in theory, it could go either way. There were a few verses that there was like a debate where they say, okay, you were permitted to fight here and then a peaceful verse came and then that, that peaceful verse actually abrogated the violent verse. But then afterwards, then that peaceful verse got abrogated again. So they all would agree that the final marching order is offensive, war-making jihad. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and it's important because we're going to look at this soon, but sometimes you can be peaceful, but that doesn't change the fact that offensive jihad is allowed. Excellent. We need to look at Quran chapter 2, verses 2, 5, 6. There is no compulsion in religion. So this is everyone's favorite verse in the West, right? Like even liberals quoted to defend Islam. And the tafsirs on this verse is what it 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 made everything made sense to me after I understood the tafsirs on this verse. Before we actually look at the tafsirs, I'm going to give you the answer ahead of time, which is applicable to a lot of the peaceful verses and whether they have been abrogated or not. So if you forget everything else I say, just remember the following. It is true that there is a debate among Western scholars whether certain peaceful verses in the Quran is abrogated or not, but no one ever disputed the fact that offensive jihad is permissible. So for example, if a scholar held the position that a specific peaceful verse in the Quran is not abrogated and that it can still be implemented, the scholar's position is, so we can still implement this peaceful command in certain circumstances in some points in time. But we agree that the Quran does allow offense of jihad. And then alternatively, the second position would be, this peaceful verse is abrogated. We are not allowed to implement this verse under any circumstances. The Quran allows offensive jihad. So whichever position the scholars have undertaken regarding specific peaceful verses in the Quran being abrogated or not, collectively their position is we all agree that it is permissible to conduct offensive jihad. Even though we disagree on whether certain peaceful verses have been abrogated and if we are still allowed to be peaceful towards the enemy under certain limited circumstances or not. So don't get confused when the scholar says that specific peaceful verses is not abrogated. Just because you believe a verse is not abrogated, it doesn't mean that the scholar doesn't believe in offensive jihad. It just means that he thinks you can still be peaceful in some circumstances. Back to chapter 2, verse 256 specifically, we are going to read Al-Qurtubi's tafsir together because he lists all of the different views very nicely. So he says, scholars differ on the meaning of this verse into six points of view. The first, it was abrogated because the Prophet forced the Arabs to adopt the religion of Islam and fought them and only accepted Islam from them. Sulaiman ibn Musa took that view saying that it is abrogated by our Prophet to jihad against the unbelievers and the hypocrites. The second view, it is not abrogated but it was sent down about the people of the book specifically, meaning that they are not forced to embrace Islam if they pay the jizya. Those who are forced are the idolaters. Only Islam is accepted from them, and they are the ones about whom the ayah, Quran 9, 73, was revealed. And this is the position of al-Shabi, Qatar al Hasan, and al-Dahaq. The third view, that it was just revealed about the Ansar, and the fourth view, that is again about the Ansar and no compulsion was abrogated and he was commanded to fight the people of the book. 
in the third position, it just means that don't call those who embraced Islam through the sword compelled or forced. Even though they technically were, just don't call them forced. That, that's the fifth view. The sixth view is that it is about the captives who were people of the book. They are not compelled when they are adults. If they are Magians, young or old, or idolaters, they are compelled to adopt Islam because their captivity does not help their captors when they are idolaters. Do you not see that their slaughtered animals are not eaten, nor their women married, that they, the idolaters, accept eating dead animal meat and impure things and others? Their owner cannot benefit from owning them because he is disgusted. Hence, he is allowed to force them to convert to Islam. That is what Ibn al-Qasim reported from Malik. Ashab said that children are considered to have the religion of those who have captured them. If they refuse that, they are compelled to become Muslim. Children have no religion and that is why they are compelled to enter Islam so that they do not go to a false religion. When other types of unbelievers pay the jizya, they are not forced to become Muslim whether they are Arabs or non-Arabs, Quraysh or otherwise. To summarize all of these things that occurred to be says, there are six different views. So either it was abrogated because Muhammad forced Arabs into Islam, or it was revealed about the people of the book specifically who are not forced into Islam if they pay the jizya. Or it was revealed about the Ansar, or it was revealed about the adult captives among the people of the book. Or it just means don't call those who were compelled through the sword compelled or forced. So notice something very important. Al-Qurtabi, he never said that Muhammad didn't force the Arabs to adopt Islam. He's just reporting this as a simple fact. They don't, they don't object to this. They use it as an argument to say, yeah, this is a valid argument. We're not disputing this. This is, this is just granted. Notice what none of the scholars said was an option, and that's what the, the modern Western PC crowd would like it to believe, that there's freedom of religion and anyone can believe whatever they want to believe. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So if the verse is not abrogated, it just means that the verse is limited to a specific group of people. It does not mean that offensive jihad and forced conversions are not allowed. So if you ask my opinion, I personally don't believe that Quran 2256 is actually abrogated, but I'm still 100% convinced that Islam allows offensive jihad. I don't like it when non-Muslims, like especially those with a big crowd say, oh, Quran chapter 2 verse 256, it is abrogated, as if that is actually the case, and that's 100% sure, because it's not. So everyone is assuming and dismissing it as being abrogated, and as a result, it gives the impression that the verse is some universal, peaceful verse when it isn't. When people pretend that this verse is peaceful, right? It gives the impression to Muslims that, hey, if I can prove that the verse isn't abrogated, then Islam is peaceful. But as we see, this just isn't the case. If it hasn't been abrogated, then the verse isn't actually peaceful to begin with. So best case scenario, if the verse isn't abrogated, which I believe it isn't, then it just means that you can't force people into Islam if you even allow them to pay the jizya. If they can pay the jizya and they pay it, then okay, you don't force them into Islam. That's it. It's not a peaceful command in the verse at all. So what happens if they refuse to pay the jizya? Ever thought about that? Then you fight them, you kill them. So this is not a peaceful verse at all. If anyone thinks that I'm making like all of this up and I'm just reading into it and I'm spinning my own narrative, even though al Qurtabi is very clear on the issue, well, then I can bring even more clarity and explicit statements from Al-Tabari on the issue. Al-Tabari quoted the position of Al-Dahak and Qatara saying that Muhammad forced the Arabs into Islam. He did not accept anything from them except there is no God but Allah or else the sword. They were compelled to religion by the sword. And neither the Jews, the Christians, nor the Magians were compelled if they gave the jizya. al tabari his view, he says the correct view of, out of these statements is the statements of those who said the verse was revealed regarding a group of people. And they said, when Allah, may he be exalted, revealed the verse, there is no compulsion in religion. He was referring to the people of the two books and the Magi. 
and to all that affirm their religion against the religion of truth, and taking the jizya from them. And they denied that any of it was abrogated. We have said that this is the correct one. This is the correct interpretation, right? So al tabari says the verse is not abrogated. He goes on. Looks what, look what he says. All the Muslims have reported on behalf of their prophet that he forced a group of people into, his, into Islam and refused to accept anything from them except them converting to Islam. And he ordered their execution if they rejected Islam. And these were the pagan Arab polytheists and the apostates. And they also reported how he did not force other groups into Islam but collected the jizya from them and allowed them to follow their false religions. And these are the people of the two books and those that resemble them. From this, it is clear that the ayah, there is no compulsion in religion, means that there is no compulsion on those from whom collecting jizya is permitted and that have accepted the rule of Islam on them. So yes, the verse, most likely it is not abrogated, but it is just in reference to those who can still pay the jizya. While other groups are forced into Islam and offensive jihad is still waged against everyone unless they become Muslim or if they decide to pay the jizya, if they are given that option. So pretending that this is a peaceful verse is futile. It's like saying, hey Farius, you need to pay the jizya or I'm gonna kill you mate. So that doesn't sound very peaceful. Definitely. Yeah, def definitely not very peaceful. And I like what Al Tabri's done here. He's, he's taken the life of Muhammad and he's reasoned from that and said, you know, Muhammad kind of did these two different things. If they were polytheists, he said, convert or die. If they were Jews or Christians, he said, convert, pay the jizya or die. And, and that's what the verse means. And any Muslim who comes after that is saying that they know better than Muhammad. Muhammad misunderstood what the Quran meant because his example should be the best example to follow, supposedly. Yeah, exactly. And notice that it actually says all the Muslims have reported, right? So it's not like, oh, a couple of Muslims. No, it's all the Muslims. It's actually a consensus, right? So this isn't a fringe view at all. This is normative. So and just to like emphasize what I just said, Ibn Hazm similarly said, the messenger of Allah compelled those who are not people of the book to embrace Islam or the sword. And the whole community agrees that an apostate is forced into Islam. And similarly, Al-Khatabi, he said, the ruling of the verse is limited to the Jews it was revealed about. As for forcing the disbelievers to follow the religion of truth, it is obligatory. So not just allowed, but obligatory to convert people into Islam by force. Yeah, exactly. So back to this discussion of the four stages of jihad. The first stage, it is quite obvious in the beginning of Islam, in Muhammad's prophethood, he was completely prohibited from engaging in warfare. And then in the second stage, he was permitted to engage in jihad. And in the third stage, defensive jihad was obligated. So fighting was prohibited then permitted, and then defensive jihad was obligated. So no one's actually going to dispute these three, like even the westernized Muslims, they will acknowledge the above. But stage four is what a lot of Muslims will reject today, or they will actually just completely misrepresent what stage four actually is. Stage four is the final stage which Allah left the Muslims with. So here Allah made it obligatory for Muslims to fight the disbelievers wherever they are found. Offensive Jihad was obligatory. Before we discuss Offensive Jihad, we first need to define Offensive Jihad. Offensive Jihad is when the Muslims venture out of the lands of Islam to fight against the disbelievers in order to expand the territory held by Muslims, keep away the harm of the disbelievers, and eradicate shirk and kufr. Offensive Jihad, in its true sense, is not limited to only preventative attacks. And from this point on, it will become even more clear. A lot of westernized Muslims, they say that offensive jihad, it's only preventative attacks. So they point towards the historical context behind Quran 929, and they proclaim that Muhammad heard that the enemies scattered their forces to attack the Muslims. Then the Muslims went to attack them first. So Quran 929, it's only offensive jihad in the sense that it is preventative attacks. I'm sure we've all heard this. 
Looking at the historical context of a verse, it is important, but it cannot be looked at in isolation and ignore everything else. The classical Muslim scholars look at the generality of the verses in question, and not only the historical context wherein the passage was revealed. For example, if I said, go and kill the disbelievers in the Arabian Peninsula, it will naturally include preventative attacks against the disbelievers, right? But it will not be limited to that circumstance. The command was formulated in a general sense that goes beyond only preventative attacks and a specific historical context. It includes offensive warfare in its true sense. And this is how the classical scholars understood verses such as Quran 9.5 and 9.29. They looked at the generality of the verses in question. Coming back to the stages of Jihad, Yuman Qayyim explains it as follows. So he enjoined fighting against all of the polytheists upon them. So it was forbidden, then it was permitted, then it was commanded for those who are attacked, and then it was commanded against all of the polytheists. Right? So he makes a distinction between defensive jihad being obligated and then fighting everyone. He continues in the same book. He remained for 13 years warning the people without fighting, and he was commanded to patiently persevere. Then it was permitted for him to migrate to Al Medina and then to fight. After that, he was commanded to fight those who fought him. Then Allah commanded him to make war on the polytheists until every kind of worship was for Allah alone. That this is forever, including for today. Abu Ayyan Ay said, It is said this refers to all disbelievers. They have been ordered to fight them and kill them everywhere. Al Nisaburi said, he was given permission to fight the idolaters in general. And finally, Allah Most High made jihad an obligation. Similarly, Ibn Juzay, he said, Fighting was not permissible in the beginning of Islam. Then the command was given to fight the disbelievers who fought the Muslims, but not those who didn't fight them. But after, the command was given to fight all the disbelievers. Similarly, Al-Babarti, he says, If they fight you, then fight them indicates that you can only fight the infidel if they fight you, but it has been abrogated. And the explanation is that Allah's messenger was initially commanded to forbear and turn away from the polytheists, but then he was permitted to fight when the initiation was from them. And then he commanded initiating fighting in some periods. And then he commanded initiating fighting absolutely in all time periods and places. So you will notice that some of the scholars have three or four or even more stages of jihad. So this is why I say that the four stages of jihad, it's not a canonical division or something. And some of them, they even describe stage two and three a bit differently. But if you notice, this, and this is important, when they discuss the final stage, they are unanimous. Offensive jihad is obligated and it's not preventative or defensive. It is offensive in its true sense. You have to fight everyone. So by now, it should be clear that offensive jihad is not just preventative attacks because they are repeatedly affirming that Muslims are to initiate jihad in all times and all places, fight and kill disbelievers everywhere. So this is the ancient times, right? So people say, do the people in the modern day still believe this? Now, except the terrorist groups, right? Outside of ISIS and Al-Qaeda, two people in the modern times accept this. Of course, the westernized scholars are moving away from true Islam, and that is a good thing, but you will still find a couple of them here and there in the West, and they are holding true to the true Islam. In the Middle East, however, it is much easier to find scholars that still support offensive jihad. Sheikh Abdullah bin Muhammad bin Humayd he was the ex-chief justice of Saudi Arabia. And in his book, Jihad in the Quran and the Sunnah, he also confirms exactly what we just looked at, all of the different stages of Jihad. Abdul Aziz bin Baz, he was the Grand Mufti of Saudi Arabia from 1993 until his death in 1999. And he said, those who say that Jihad is for defense only is incorrect. This was the Grand Mufti of Saudi Arabia just over 20 years ago. And interestingly, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia also has an organization called the Permanent Committee for Scholarly Research and IFTA, and they wrote the following. 
Islam spread by means of proof and evidence to those who listened to the message and responded to it. And it spread by means of force and the sword to those who were stubborn and arrogant until they were overwhelmed and no longer became stubborn. And they submitted to that reality. Keep this in mind, right? So in order to emphasize the consistency in this belief, look what Ibn Taymiyyah said. The soundness of the religion is based on the Quran and the sword. Ibn Qayyim said, Allah has established the religion of Islam with proof and evidence and with the sword and spear, both together and inseparable. So, as you can see, the Permanent Committee for Scholarly Research at IFTA in Saudi Arabia is merely reaffirming what Muslims have believed for centuries. There is literally no difference. There is one Islam. And if anyone thinks, oh, Ibn Taymiyyah is just an extremist and Ibn Qayyim was his student, so he just followed his teacher's views and Saudi Arabia is just following the extremist views of the Hanbalis, well, then we can just go further back in time and look what the Shafi scholar Ghazali said. He said, so the second group of people, a party that inclines away from the true belief, such as the Kafirs and the deviant innovators, nothing works on this group except the whip and the sword. Most of the disbelievers embraced Islam under the shades of swords. It's a great line yeah. there. <laughs> Admitting that not many people were convinced by the so-called evidence, they were mostly convinced by the sword. Yeah, like notice that he says, those of weak minds that are stuck in blind imitation and are argumentative based on falsehoods from the beginning of their lives until old age. So yeah, if you are argumentative, he admits nothing works on you, just a whip and a sword, that'll do it. <laughs> yep. Yeah. A little bit messed up, but yeah. Little more than a little bit messed up. So, another important scholar in the modern day would be Sheikh Saleh Al Fawzan. He is a member of the senior ulama in Saudi Arabia and he advises the king of Saudi Arabia on religious matters. And he wrote the following The fourth type of jihad is that the jihad waged against the disbelievers. This is preceded by inviting them towards Allah and by preaching to them about Islam. If they accept it, then Alhamdulillah. If after Islam was propagated to them and they reject it, then jihad is performed against them to seize the fitna perpetrated by them and to protect the Muslims from their evil. Jihad is also waged against them so as to make worship exclusive to Allah alone, for he has no partners. So after quoting some of the classic verses, he says, Worship is not permitted to anyone else except Allah alone. He who worships other than Allah has committed shirk, and a war is waged against those who commit this until they accede to the worship of Allah. So it's clear you are fought because of your shirk, not because of your aggression, it's because of your shirk. So when you refuse to convert to Islam, and when you don't worship Allah, the Muslims will wage war against you. And this guy, he advises the king of Saudi Arabia. Could you, Farias, imagine having an advisor in the White House saying such things to Donald Trump or Joe Biden as we have here in Saudi Arabia? Yeah, I imagine if someone tried to say that in America, that would be the end of their presidency or the end of the advisors advising the presidency because the public would be, there'd be a huge outcry. Everyone would say, how can you be so evil? How can you be so racist? How can you be so hateful? And here we have it happening today in Saudi Arabia. And in fairness to them, they're just following their religion correctly. They're just following it the same way it has always been followed. But yeah, it's nothing like what the West would consider proper behavior by any means. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So Sheikh Salah al Fawzan, he continues by saying, Allah says, then fight the polytheists wherever you find them. These people are described as those who associate partners with Allah. This is the reason for the command to fight them. So this is the reason, right? This type of jihad is offensive, i.e. to initiate the war against the disbelievers. The deviated and ignorant authors write that there is no waging of war in Islam for it is not an aggressive religion. In fact, it is a religion that advocates only peace. It enjoins peace among people who are left to do as they please. This is a fabrication against Islam. Islam is the truth and everything else is falsehood. 
Therefore, the truth must be established and falsehood eradicated. This cannot be achieved except by inviting people towards Allah, followed by jihad in the path of Allah. Islam was spread by the sword with regards to those who rejected and refused to Islam. In the present time, Christian evangelists actively propagate their ideology in the world, which has resulted in Muslims abandoning jihad. So, I love that line there. Yeah. <laughs> he's, bla he's blaming the spread of Christianity for Muslims not wanting to do jihad anymore. Thus, both uh, supporting the, the idea that Christianity is peaceful and teaches peace and, and supporting the idea that Islam is the opposite. Of course, he's saying that's a bad thing, but he's agreeing with us on that point. Yeah, exactly. And ironically, we are only preaching peace because that's what Jesus preached, right? That's the gospel. And he supposedly believes in Jesus and yet clearly complete 180 on this whole topic of peace and war. Absolutely. I do agree with the logic of the scholars that you've shown throughout, though, that because of the way 9.5, 929, et cetera, are phrased, it has to be universal. It doesn't make any sense that it would be about just a specific people in a specific place, because the reasons given for fighting them are their actions. For example, fighting the Christians because they say that Jesus is the son of God. Well, every Christian says that, so that's pretty universal. You got to fight every Christian who says that. Well, that's every Christian, not just some in a specific time and place. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And this is actually brilliantly led up to the next topics. There are many foundational reasons for why offensive jihad is undertaken. Al-Ghazi, he said, the people of the book are characterized by four qualities that make it necessary to fight them until they yield into Islam or until they give the jizya. The first quality is that they do not believe in Allah. So it is our lack of belief that warrants us to be fought. It's not us being aggressive or anything like that. It is just our lack of belief. And similarly, Ibn Rushd said, why wage war? The Muslim jurists agreed that the purpose of fighting the people of the book, excluding the Quraysh people of the book and the Christian Arabs, is one of two things. It is either for their conversion to Islam or the payment of the jizya. And then he quotes Quran 9.29. And then Al-Tabarani said, this means you fight them to get Islam from them. So you fight them so they can convert. This is the reasons, right? Mm -hmm. And then Ibn Daimiyah said, if the religion isn't totally for Allah, then it is obligatory to fight until the religion is for Allah. He also continued by saying, whoever gets the message of the Prophet to believe and practice the religion of Allah, which he has revealed to him, but does not respond to it. So if he does not convert, we are to fight him until the religion of Allah prevails. And then he continues by saying, since lawful warfare is essentially jihad, and since its aim is that the religion is entirely for Allah, and the words of Allah is uppermost, therefore, according to all Muslims, those who stand in the way of this aim must be fought. So Fadius, me and you and other people, we are currently standing in the way for Allah's word to be supreme. And according to Ibn Taymiyyah, it is the consensus that we have to be fought as a result. Our mere existence as unbelievers, not possessing a covenant of security, requires us to be fought. It seems crystal clear to me that the cause of needing to fight us has nothing to do with our posture towards Muslims. It's simply the result of our religious beliefs. Exactly. And al Sarashi said this explicitly. We are ordered to kill the disbelievers because of them fighting, them, them being rude or something. No, just because of their disbelief. It's the disbelief that warrants you to be killed. So these are the main reasons or the foundational reasons for why they wage jihad. People need to abandon their idolatry. The goal is to eradicate disbelief. Islam has to prevail over all other religions. Only Allah has to be worshipped. Allah's word needs to be supreme. Muslims shouldn't be enticed to other religions. The goal of fighting them is to make them pay the jizya or converting to Islam. Those who refuse to convert to Islam are to be fought and people are killed because of their disbelief. Anyone who stands in the way of Islam prevailing over all other religions are to be fought. 
So all of the above are part of the foundational reasons for why jihad has to be waged, which makes it abundantly clear that jihad is because of religious reasons, right? And non-Muslims showing any sorts of aggression is irrelevant. And to make this even more clear, we could have ended this video like 10, 15 minutes ago, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> but to make this even more clear, Abu Bakr al yassar said, we do not know of any one of the jurists that prohibit fighting those who have abandoned fighting us from the polytheist. And he also said, this is a general ruling with regards to fighting the polytheist, whether they initiate fighting against us or not. And similarly, in al it says, fighting the Kufar is obligatory, even if they do not initiate, due to the generality of the verses. Ibn Atiyah said, this is an unrestrained command to fight with no condition that the disbelievers initiate it. And al Qurtabi said, it is an unrestricted command to fight with no condition mentioned that the disbelievers have to be the initiators of the fighting. It feels like it's the exact same quote, just different scholars in different centuries <laughs> repeating the exact same thing, which is exactly my point, right? Yeah, if the Quran is clear and Islam's teachings are clear, then we should expect the different scholars to say basically the same thing, you know, maybe slightly different words, but same ideas, and that's what we find. But those ideas don't support modern claims at all. Yeah, exactly. And then Ibn Azam said, it is permissible to kill among the idolaters with the exception of those who we have mentioned, all fighters, non-fighters, merchants, workmen, that is laborers, the elderly of sound mind or not, the former, bishops, priests, monks, the blind, and the crippled who do not hinder anyone. And it is also permissible to spare them. So yeah, yeah, you can kill that crippled man on the side of the street, you can kill him, but hey, it's also permissible to spare him though, but yeah, you can kill him. So he made killing general for all idolaters unless they yield into Islam. Al Nawawi said it is permissible to kill a monk, a workman, an old man, a blind man, and the chronically ill who do not fight. There is a difference of opinion among the scholars regarding some of these groups of people and whether they can be killed or not. So I discussed this a bit more in my research document, but Ibn Rushd explains as follows. Al Shafi argued on the basis of the tradition of Samura that the Prophet said, kill the old among the polytheists and keep alive their young. It appears that the effective underlying cause for slaying, in his view, is this belief. It is necessary then that this cause be applied to all the non believers. And then, after he listed two narrations that prohibited the killing of peasants or serfs, he says, the reason leading to their disagreement on the whole arises from their dispute about the effective underlying cause of slaying. Thus, those who maintained that the effective underlying cause for this is disbelief did not exempt anyone out of the polytheist, while those who maintained that the underlying cause is in its ability to fight, there being a prohibition about the killing of women, though they are unbelievers, exempted those who do not have the ability to wage war or those who have not affiliated themselves with it like the peasants and the serfs. So basically, regarding whether you can kill farmers or priests, monks, the blind, the old, the crippled, they can be killed because the command to kill unbelievers is unrestricted and based upon their disbelief. Or the second view says they can be killed based on the perceived ability they have to potentially wage war. So it's not that they engage in war and then they are killed, it's just whether you suspect they are capable of that. So, for example, with the crippled person, if you suspect that he has no ability, then some people will say, okay, don't kill the crippled. But if you perceive that, hey, this crippled, maybe he can handle a drone or something, right? And attack the Muslims, maybe that's theoretically possible. Then you can kill him. Ipetamiya said, to summarize, when Barah was revealed, he was ordered to dissociate from and wage war against every disbeliever and nullify every unrestricted treaty that had existed between them, irrespective of whether they had fought him or not. Jihad against those who do not fight us among the idolaters and the people of the book is further manifestation of the religion. If you fight someone and they don't show any aggression, you're just manifesting Islam, that's it. 
and Ibn Hajar al Aitami said, there is no dispute between us and them that the original disbeliever, if the invitation to Islam reached him and he declined to respond, convert to Islam, and he fought with his hand or tongue, or even without fighting, he is certainly to be killed. And of course, yet again, these views, they're not just in a distant past or found in terrorist groups today. It is found among Saudi Arabia's most influential scholars. For example, Sheikh Mohammed ibn Ibrahim, the first Grand Mufti of Saudi Arabia, said the following. As is well known, the polytheists are fought due to their shirk, not their aggression. With the evidence being the hadith, I have been ordered to fight the people until they testify. There is no deity worthy of worship except Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. This brings me to a related note, which is based on the following authentic hadiths. The messenger of Allah said, I have been commanded to fight the people until they say there is no God but Allah. If they say it, then their blood and wealth are protected from me except for a right that is due from it, and their reckoning will be with Allah. It says that you will be protected once you become a Muslim. So this means that the reverse is true as well. If you are not a Muslim, your blood is not protected. So anyone can be killed unless there is something that specifically prohibits his blood from being shed. For example, if he is a Muslim or if he or if he, she is a woman, or if they might possess a covenant of security. So things like this. It is permissible to shed the blood of a disbeliever due to his disbelief by default unless stated otherwise. And Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, he explained this. And also the permissibility of the blood of a dummy is a common misconception due to the existence of the disbelief, which is what permits the blood. But the dhimma contract is a preventative covenant which stops the killing, while the grounds, i.e. the permissibility of his blood, will still exist which is his disbelief. And similarly, Al-Shafi said, and Al-Shafi, by the way, he's the founder of the Shafi School of Jurisprudence. He said, he allowed shedding the blood of a mature man who refrain from belief if they do not have covenant. And al qurtubi said, when a Muslim meets a Kafir who has no covenant, then it is permissible for him to kill him. Similarly, Al-Nawawi said, as for the Kafir that has no contract of peace, there is no liability in killing him from whatever religion he may be. And Al Shafqani said, The polytheist, whether he fights or not, his blood is permissible to spill as long as he is a polytheist. Ibn al Al Rabi said, In summary, if a Muslim meets a Kafir who does not have a covenant, it is permissible for him to kill him. Ibn Garfiya said, Ibn Jarir narrated consensus that it is permissible to kill a polytheist if he has no contract of security. And there's more. It feels like an advert, but wait, there's more. <laughs> so, Asarafsi said, safety from execution is established only by a guarantee of safety or belief in Islam. And Ibn Taymiyyah said, and this belief in Muharrama is present in every Kafir. So it is permissible to enslave him as it is permissible to kill him. Man, it's just a scholar after scholar after scholar after scholar saying the same thing. They're all, as you said, you know, it, it, it sounds repetitive, but you're not reading the same things. You're reading different scholars. They're just saying the same thing. Everyone agrees. They all agree that it's permissible to kill the unbelievers. Whether or not they fight you, whether or not they're capable of fighting you, just the fact that they disbelieve in Islam is sufficient. And I would agree that that would be what the Quran implies. You know, it doesn't say anything about them fighting you first. It doesn't say anything about their ability to fight. It just says, kill them because they are polytheists or kill them because they make Jesus the son of God or kill them because they make Uzair the son of God, even though no Jew actually does that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now we're coming to the, towards the end and now we need to talk about Jizya. What is the jizya and who is allowed to pay the jizya? A jizya it is a tax a non-Muslim has to pay while living under the Islamic State, which signifies them having a covenant of security, right? A demo contract, which prohibits their blood to be shed. 
That is what the Jesya is on the basic level. So we always hear, oh, it's just a normal tax. It's not a big deal. But Alcorta be reported from Katara that the word disgrace refers to killing in the case of the Harbi and the Jizya in the case of Edamin. So the Jizya is a disgrace. When was taxes ever a disgrace? And Alcorta be said, punish them with a severe torment in this world. And this means killing, crucifixion, imprisonment, and the Jizya. So it is a severe torment. Similarly, Disbelieved, I was severely punished in this world, and this means the Jezia. And Imam al Jawzi said, and he said that these are the Jews and Christians, their punishment in this world is by the sword and the Jezia. Clearly, it's not just a normal tax, right? Normal taxes aren't intimately connected to Quran 929, where it means that it's a disgrace and humiliated and belittled, right? That you will be miserable, disgraced, humiliated. So you can continue being humiliated, degraded, and disgraced. This is not a normal tax. For example, it also says, Jezia is imposed in the place of death. So it is not imposed on one whose killing is not permitted due to unbelief, like children and women. So some people's blood is permitted due to their unbelief. The Jezia is imposed on them instead of death. While other people like women and children, they cannot be killed under normal circumstances due to their unbelief, so no jizya is imposed on them. I can't remember when I refuse to pay taxes that the government will kill me. Like, <laughs> that's clearly not a normal tax, right? <laughs> yeah, definitely. And the government doesn't have taxes in order to try to humiliate you. It's not the amount of money that Muslims demand of the, the Jews and Christians that matters. Uh, that part, just demanding money, maybe they could justify that. I mean, kind of not because they first conquered your land. It's not like you voluntarily moved to their land, but they can at least kind of justify the money. We know that purpose isn't to collect more funds from the government. The purpose is to make them feel like set class citizens and feel humiliated and want to convert to Islam because they don't want to be second class citizens. Yeah, exactly. So that covers the aspect of what the jizya is. But now, who can pay the jizya? There is no clear answer because there is a disagreement among the scholars. Primarily, the disagreement is regarding whether polytheists are allowed to pay the jizya. However, something they did unanimously agree upon is the fact that apostates are not allowed to pay the jizya. Once you become an apostate, you only have the option of Islam or death you are not offered another option. So if you are a polytheist in India and the Muslims conquered your land, depending on the school of jurisprudence in the region, you may or may not be offered to pay Jujizya. Now we're going to look at the scholars. So Ibn Qayyim said, the jurists have a consensus on the permissibility of taking the Jizya from the people of the book and the Magians. So this is a consensus, they agree. Ibn Taymiyyah also says, as for the people of the book and the Magians, they are to be fought until they become Muslim or pay the jizya. But others, the jurists differ as to the lawfulness of taking the jizya from them. Most of them regard it as unlawful to accept it from the Arabs. Al Sarashi said, the apostates and Arab idolaters, only Islam or the sword will be accepted. Abu Ayyan said, the school of jurisprudence of Abu Anifa is that jizya is not accepted from idolaters among the Arabs nor from the apostates. It is only Islam or be killed. al Qurtabi says, this is the ruling for those from whom jizya is not taken. This is coupled with you will fight them, that is, one of the two options will hold, either fighting or Islam. There is no third option besides these two. Ibn al Rifa said, the apostate is compelled to Islam. No jizya is accepted from him. Right? So remember, the apostate consensus that he is forced into Islam or killed. But the other groups of people, there's a disagreement. This is also found in Al Adaya. Those from whom the jizya is not accepted are the apostates or the idol worshippers from among the Arabs, because only Islam is accepted from them. So it's only Islam or death for the apostates and idol worshippers, according to the Hanafis. Ibn Hazm said, 
Jezia is not accepted from a Jew, a Christian, or Magan, except by them agreeing that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah to us, and that they do not defame him or anything in the religion of Islam. And Malik said, any dummy who says, indeed, Muhammad has been sent to you all, but not to us. There is no issue with him. But if he says he was not a prophet, he is killed. So you can say, okay, Muhammad wasn't sent to us, he was sent to you. That's okay, we tolerate that. But if you say he was not a prophet, then you are killed. So yet again, it's about your faith. Or in the case of this, in a dummy, what you speak. And Ibn Azam says, nothing is accepted from a disbeliever except Islam or the sword. Men and women alike, except the people of the book in particular, these being Jews, Christians, and Magians only. Indeed, if these people give Jizya, they can stay that way as long as they are abased. Abu Hanifa and Malak said, however, those Arabs who are not specifically people of the book, either Islam or the sword. al Dabarani said, fight them until they yield into Islam. No jizya is accepted from the heathens, and nothing but Islam is satisfactory from them. They are not like the people of the book from whom jizya is taken. The heathens, right, the idolaters, Allah refuses to be pleased with them except either by Islam or killing. And again, for nothing else except Islam is to be accepted from the heathen. If they refuse, they are to be killed. The people of the book and the magus are fought until they submit or give the jizya. The other disbelievers, they are fought until they submit. Right? So they are fought until they become Muslim. So deaf or convert. Everyone else, except the Jewish Christians and Magans, if they do not accept Islam, then kill them. Except the idol worshippers from among the Arabs, the Hadith operator is a general evidence for accepting the jizya from every disbeliever. Although he, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, excludes the idol worshippers from amongst the Arabs due to the severity of their disbelief. Then Ibn al-Jawzi said, Al-Qadi Abu Yala has said, because when Allah honored Islam with power, he commanded that we accept nothing from the Arab polytheist but Islam or the sword. So you can see that there is some dispute about who exactly is allowed to pay the jizya. So the dispute is primarily revolving or yeah, revolving around the question whether the Hadith operator was abrogated by the ninth chapter of the Quran or not. Just to summarize this last section, it's clear that all of these groups of people are forced into Islam and they have no other choice. And throughout this video, we have repeatedly seen the consistency of what Jihad actually is. And now recall what we discussed all the way back in the beginning regarding how jihad and martyrdom is glorified. With that in mind, now you can see how truly terrifying all of this actually is. That's the end yeah, of my presentation. Yeah, excellent presentation there. Um, just a quick note on the jizya. We did see that some allowed polytheists to, to give it. Most did not. And I, I think there's a reason that most don't. And that's because the Quran doesn't say that Muhammad didn't practice that by example either. So they're kind of just either relying on their own sense of morality to allow this, or more likely they're kind of thinking about their own pocketbook and saying, hey, if we allow this tax to be collected for more people, we might raise more funds. But the majority, they want to go with what the Quran and Muhammad say, which is just Jews and Christians. The main difference among about who can pay the jizya among the scholars, the differences they say is regarding the Hadith of Bereda, because if the Quran chapter 9 abrogated it, then it can go either way. But if the Hadith of Bereda was after that, then maybe you can still accept the jizya from them. So it's a dispute whether it abrogates it or not, which came first. So that's the main reason for why they disagree about which of the polytheists they can accept it from or not. Excellent. Thank you for that clarification there. And then we did also see some slight disagreement on how severe to be with the Jews and Christians. Most just said you can accept it from them. But a couple placed conditions even on the Jews and Christians where they're like, they have to acknowledge that Muhammad's a prophet or else we're, we can't collect it from them, which I don't think that any Jew or Christian would willingly acknowledge that. I mean, a few might say it with their mouths to avoid being killed, but I don't think any would really want to say that. I don't think that if you, you're a Christian 
that you believe that Muhammad is a prophet. They're kind of incompatible with one another. Talking about the whole presentation, I, I think you, you tied it all together really well, where these claims about it just being an inner struggle and uh, has nothing to do with war, or if it has anything to do with war, it's only about defense. They're kind of totally undermined by the Islamic history, the Islamic scholars, the words of Muhammad, don't really have much of anything to stand upon, I would say. Yeah, exactly, exactly. All right, any closing thoughts from you? Yeah, I would just like to say, even though this is a bit obvious, just remember that a lot of Muslims, mostly those in the West, they don't believe in a true version of Islam. So when it comes to some of these topics, don't attack them physically or verbally. Remember that God wants us to be as wise as serpents, but as innocent as doves. And always speak in a loving and charitable manner. And don't just always use a bulldozer approach, right? Where you just want to get under people's skin and get the dopamine or something. Always try to put yourself in the other person's shoes who are you speaking to and talk to them in a personalized way that will make a positive impact on them. Because it's not just to get some debate points. You really care about that person. You want to help them. I will be looking forward to the comment sections and feedback from people. And if they are interested in topics like child marriage or marital slave rape and maybe apostasy and blasphemy, even though those topics are kind of obvious, but yeah, <laughs> we'll see yeah, well... what the people demand. <laughs> It may be obvious, but it also is very beneficial to get all the sources out there. You know, it's one thing if you're just equipped with a couple of Quran verses and when you go into a discussion with a Muslim and they can try to deny those verses, it's quite another thing if you also have the Muslim scholars to back you up. And it's a little bit harder to deny. So I, I would reiterate what you just said about taking this information, using it in a loving manner, not trying to beat someone over the head to win a debate. We're not trying to levy our own jizya against them where we're trying to make them feel humiliated. The point isn't to humiliate someone. The point is to get someone thinking, get someone questioning, get someone moving towards the truth. If you just make someone feel bad, you, you probably haven't gained anything. But if you get someone thinking, you get someone start to question whether Islam is the truth or not, then they're on their way to being free of Islam. So thank you for joining me, MK. I thought this was a really excellent presentation and I look forward to you coming on again. Thank you very much. And thank you for having me on and making all of this possible because without you, this wouldn't have ever gotten on YouTube. So I really appreciate it. Thank you a lot. Alrighty. God bless everyone. See you again next time.